All right, everyone, let's go on. What we've got here is our basic web page, basic structure. We've written structural HTML. We've written HTML code that creates a structure. Uh, and this structure also has a meaning. These tags have a semantic meaning. H1 means something. It means a heading, number one, big and bold. The consequence is that it's big and bold. It looks big and bold, yes, but it has the meaning that it is the biggest, most important thing on the page. It has meaning. So in modern web design, app design, there's a tendency to separate form and content, or style and content, which is what we'll be doing in this class. And that sounds highfalutin, but basically what it means is we're going to write HTML code to, to, to create the structure of our apps, and then we're going to write CSS code to define the style, the look and feel of the interface. So we've, all, we've written here HTML, HTML5. We're about to write some CSS. CSS is cascading style sheets. And that basically means uh, make this red, make this with a drop shadow, make this centered. So all of that um, visual definition is made via CSS. And we're going to write this in the most basic direct way at the moment, and then we'll get more advanced. But what I want to do is I want to change the boring colors of my website here. Uh, by default, it's black text on a white background with blue links. In the beginning, 1989, it looked the same, except it was a gray background. Question? Well, you do You can, uh, but I rec highly recommend to do it via CSS. It's the more modern way to do it and we will see why it's so powerful. But if you know the old ways to do it, you're still free to do it, but they might not technically be HTML5 compliant. So I want a, uh, I want a blue background. I want a pink background. I want a yellow background. I want a background that fades from red to yellow, maybe. And that's going to be done through CSS. So here's one way to do it. The default behavior of the, of the background is white. I'm going to change that default behavior to be blue. So we'll do it this way. Go back to line 6. That should be where your body tag starts. We're going to change the default. We do it this way. We're going to add an attribute to the body tag. So click after the letter Y and add a space. Make sure you're in the tag right there. And we're going to add this uh, attribute called style equals quote end quote. So this format looks familiar. We had image and the attribute style equals or uh, source equals something. We had the a tag for a link and the attribute href equals something. We can add style to just about everything in CSS. And style can include background colors, text colors, text sizes, the fonts, um, borders and margins, and indenting, and everything visual. But the most basic thing we'll do at this point is I want a new background color. So I'm changing the default style. So in the quotes, we'll say background dash color colon space, blue, semicolon. Okay, I want to ask a really stupid question here. Does it recognize British English? C-O-L-O-U-R. I'll answer that question in one moment. I don't know. Okay. We'll do it and we'll see what happens. Okay. Background is spelled wrong. <laughs> Background. Thank you. Background. There we go. Background dash color. 
and colon, space, and then a color. I chose blue. And then a semicolon. Both. There's a colon right after the word color, and then a semicolon after the word blue. Okay, great, I can't wait to see this. Save it, run it. What you should then get is a great searing blue color. <coughs> so did I spell color the British way properly? Um, it might not speak British English. Okay, so what happens when I'm living in London? In Scotland, we'll read it where I'm going next. Well, you write it the wrong way, and then it'll work right. When the standard was developed uh -huh. of CSS in 1998, uh -huh. it was developed in Europe, if I if I think about it, but I think yeah, they used the American English. English. No, but CSS came after HTML. Uh -huh. Yeah, for, so it, it appears to use American spelling, so background color. We have blue. Well, if that blue is uh, a little too strong, uh, try another color. Try yellow. Try pink. Try gray. Well, decide on which version of gray to spell, and try gray. What's that? Okay, so don't you use a hexadecimal color code over here? We could. We could. So did you try a color? Pink? <laughs> okay, everyone, remember, if you need a little help, uh, it's very nice to help your neighbors, but you want to be a little bit quieter. If your neighbor needs some help, make sure uh, you help them out, but be a little quieter. If you need a little help, call me, and I'll help you out too. We want to make sure everyone hears everything. Uh, so, background color pink, and it's pink. Uh, try some different colors. What about brown? Brown works. It's not quite brown. <coughs> what about purple? Does purple work? So try a color and see if it doesn't work. Have you ever heard of this color? Azure. If you haven't heard of Azure, add it and see what it looks like. Hmm. So azure is a very light blue. Um, here's another one, Alice Blue. Well, how would you ever even guess that there's a color called Alice Blue? There's Alice Blue, an even lighter version. Hmm. All right, so we have a list of, um, I think, 211 colors that we can write here that are real words, like gold. But Coca-Cola red, for example, is a very specific formula of red. And Facebook blue is a very specific formula of blue. So here I'm showing you that you can write, you know, real words, or if you know the hexadecimal or RGB color formulas, you can write that as well. Let's practice that a moment. Instead of one of these simple colors, these, uh, these uh, English word colors, let's write this. Remove the color, keep the semicolon, and write RGB, and then an open and a close parentheses. Here, we're going to mix a color formula based on red, green, blue. So just like they do over at uh, uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, you want color for the wall, 
you tell them I want uh, I want yellow, and they'll say, well, which version of our 1,000 yellows do you want? So, okay, I want uh, eggshell yellow or something. So they mix colors, and you get that perfect yellow. Here we can mix RGB colors, red, green, blue. So between 0 and 255 shades of a color. So let's try this. Let's say 100, comma, 0, okay, 100, comma, space, 0, comma, space, 0. Here I'm saying, give me 100 units of red, 0 of green, and 0 of blue. And this goes up to 255. So this will give me a color of red. I can type red, but that red color will look different than this formula. RGB. Notice it's a very specific way to write this. Make sure you write it specifically. RGB. Question over there? Question? So you want to save this and run it, of course, and then you will get a red color. There it is. Well, you can mix it, like I was saying. So, okay, let's add a little bit of um, blue. I'm going to add um, 25 units of blue, RGB. It's always in that order. Red, green, blue, RGB. I have 100 units of red, 0 of green, and 25 of blue. And that gives me... It's veering toward purple-ish, I would say. There's red, only red, and there's with a little bit of blue, purple-ish. And of course, as we increase these values, we get more... That's purple there. So we can use uh, these common names, we can use the RGB color formula, or if you know hexadecimal, you can add your color in hexadecimal. I would recommend if you're going to define colors to either do it by the, the plain name, or if you need a specific color, a color formula. Hexadecimal is a little more complicated to use. Yes? Which, which one would you say is more accurate for, you know, to have the same look across multiple screens? Well, unfortunately, that's, um, that's, a, that's a moot point, because my monitor could be calibrated a certain way, you saw that the Alice blue on your monitor looked almost white. And on me, I could vaguely see some blue. Same color. But the computer, the monitor, the web browser, there's a lot of factors that could be slightly altering the color. And we, the best we can do is, is know that we've defined the proper color and that it hopefully looks right on everyone's monitor. Hopefully, we also have good contrast. If we've got a blue and a light blue, it might look great on, on my monitor because I brought up the contrast, but on everyone else's, it looks almost the same. So that's a little bit out of our hands, but the good rule of thumb is choose, choose colors, but choose good contrast in colors. Is that true that like, you didn't go to the Coca-Cola website, every, every browser will look a little bit different? Yeah, I, at home, I have, a, I have my laptop, and then I have another monitor plugged in. And both the monitors look slightly different. So that same Coca-Cola red will look a little brighter on the on the top monitor and a little darker on my laptop monitor. And if I'm in graphic design and, <coughs> graphic design and such, I have to make my monitors look the same, so I take the time to calibrate it. But who, who here has ever calibrated a monitor? One and a half, two and a half people. So no one's calibrating their monitor. So you, yeah. Different phones, and even in the same family, you know, the, the Galaxy S that you buy and then your friend buys might not be the exact same shade. So that's just something we don't have control of at the moment.
All right, so um, let's uh, add a little more style here. Notice I've added this purple color. I like that purple color. It's my company purple color. But notice my monitor here, probably compared to yours, you can not see the text very well. On my monitor here, I can see it okay, but it does not look good here because the lights are on and such. But that's bad contrast. So it takes me back to the point earlier about you want good contrast. And an easy way to remember this is, okay, you've got foreground and background elements. The background element here obviously is the purple. What's the foreground elements? The text, the horizontal line, the picture, the link, everything else. So right now, I don't have good contrast between foreground and background. And all I really need to remember is keep them opposite. If I've got a dark background, I want a light foreground. If I've got a light background, I want a dark foreground. That's why black text on a white background looks great. Dark foreground, light background. Here, I've got dark background, dark foreground not good contrast. What color it is might not matter as long as you've got good contrast. So I need contrast here. My text needs to lighten up. So we'll do that with more CSS. I've said the body, we're changing the default style, specifically the background color. Now I want to change the text color. So let's go back to our body tag here, inside of the style attribute. And after the semicolon, space, we'll add another property here. Background color, new color. So next we want text color. And when CSS was being invented in 1998, no one got the idea to create text color. They chose color. <coughs> color means text color. So don't write text color. It doesn't do anything. The background color makes sense. Why didn't anyone say text color makes sense? Well, the standard didn't say that, so color means text color. Colon. Um, let me try pink. Semicolon. Notice I have a semicolon to differentiate each of these properties in the attribute. It's like a list, like a, like a shopping list. Eggs, comma, bacon, comma, bread. Here I'm doing background color, semicolon, color, text color, semicolon. I could do text size, semicolon. I could do text shadow, semicolon. So semicolons delineate each property that I'm affecting. There we go. Maybe you don't like the colors, but you can't deny that the contrast. Again, background is dark, foreground is light. Very readable. So uh, I'm going to give you a moment. We'll do one more thing, then I'll give you a moment. Uh, right now we're targeting everything in, in the document because we've changed the style of the whole body. We can target individual elements. I want to change, I want to alter the behavior, the default style of only Hello World. And as I said, you can add style to anything, or just about anything. Let's try that. I'm going to add style and a new background color to H1. So, same as before, we go to the, the tag, inside the tag, space, style, equals, quote, end quote, again, end your, end your, your beginning and ending elements, or else, if you forgot that quote, everything, 
breaks. I can do background color to this element, the H1 element. And I want I want to reverse the colors actually. That might be interesting. My background color, remember to spell this stuff right. Background color, I'm gonna make that pink, semicolon. And then the text color, I'll make it that RGB color. This will be a, a cool, simple trick. Everything is background of purple, and then the text is pink. But then we said, make the H1 instead background color pink and the text color purple. And the result of that looks like that, like a cutout. I punched the the letters "Hello World" through this uh, through this color. So, what did we do here? This is part of the the C in CSS cascading style sheets. Okay, style, that makes sense. It's changing the style of our content. A new background color, a new text color, a new margin, etc. Style. The C is cascading in that uh, if we define uh, some style early on, something else can supersede it. Something else can say, no, change it to this like a cascade, like a waterfall from top to bottom. We have general to specific. I said the body in general looks like this, and then in specifically the H1 looks like that. That's the C part of cascading. Question? So it's not going all the way to the edge, you're saying? Well, are you sure you wrote background color, semicolon, and then color? Color is your text color. No, well, there, there should be text there. We didn't change any of the text. You can, um, you can remove the color for the moment, the text color. You know, if it looks empty like that, this is what I'm saying, that originally we said, make all the text color pink. But then when I said make the background pink, well, now we have pink text on a pink background. And it's still there. You can select it. You can click and drag. It's still there. It's just that we have pink on pink. That's why then I defined another text color. So color. We'll just do purple for the moment. Right. Uh, did that work for you back there? Did you solve your issue? Thank you. 
All right, so this actually brought up a very good point. This actually brought up a very good point that um, this is one of the places where we don't, where we shouldn't have a space actually. RGB, no space, and then the um, parentheses. So they're few and far between, but this is one of the places where it matters. No space after RGB. And then we get that result. So again, the CSS, uh, without defining explicitly a color, it inherited the original styling, pink text. And that's why it became pink, pink text on a pink background, invisible. It's still there, but it's invisible. So the cascade is that then later on we say, no, change the color to this, purple. And so that's why then I can see the text, CSS. The last S, sheet, means the more powerful version of CSS where Notice here we're targeting these specific elements. And we could go in here and change this paragraph, and that'll work. And this is only one document, though. One document with 26 lines. Imagine if this document had 126 lines. We'd have to go to a lot of different parts of our code to um, edit the text, style the text. So if we put all of this styling information in a separate file, in a separate sheet, I can say this document here defines all of my colors and then connect it with this page, then this page gets all my colors. And then connect this to this page. So now these two pages are getting all of the style from this page, this sheet. So if I change this color to yellow, they all inherit that color. CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. Right now we've done it the most basic way. We've said this thing is that color. Later on we'll look at a more powerful way where we define all of our colors globally and they can affect 20 pages, a thousand pages. We change it in one place and it trickles down, it cascades to all pages. HTML was invented in 1989, but CSS, this design stuff, happened later in around 1998, I think, or maybe 96, around there. So for a long time, there wasn't this more efficient way to do it, and now this is the, the best way to do it, CSS. <coughs> All right, so not only can we define colors, but maybe we also want to define other presentational elements. What I mean is this. If you looked at the um, example website, on your mobile device, it looked fine. If you looked at it on a tablet, it looked fine, just bigger. It grows and shrinks depending on the size of the device. That can also be affected via CSS. We can style the document to grow or shrink, to respond to the size of the device, of the screen. So let's add some more CSS here. Let's say, well, I like that this background color is, is on Hello World, but I don't like that it goes all the way to the edge of the screen. See, if I, if I have my document like that, it goes all the way to the edge, to that dead area with nothing. Instead, I want uh, it only to take a certain amount of space, so here's what we can do. Uh, we will add another property to the style attribute. After our text color, we'll say width, and that's width as in width and height, not width, like I'm with them. Width and height, width, colon. And here we can say, for example, to try this out, let's say 300, and then we need a unit. The unit that we'll use here is px, pixels. Save it and run it and see how that looks. <coughs> so 
So we've got another property here, width, 300 px. Here's another place, no space, actually. And I remember, no space between the value and the unit. 300 px, no space. There we go, 300 px. It only goes that far, 300 pixels. So I can define the look of my document through CSS, of my web page, of my app, when we get to that part. And I can define it exactly. I can say this will take exactly this amount of space, width or height, via CSS. But even though this works, it's not the recommended way. Because these 300 pixels might look really nice on this monitor, but then it's really small on this monitor, and then it's really big on this monitor. We should not really be defining our units, if we can avoid it, as, as, a, um, as a fixed property. 300 pixels. Pixels are the dots on the screen. So here I've said 300 dots. But on this type of monitor, 300 dots means different than the one in my pocket. So I recommend, as often as we can, instead to use a relative value. Instead of this hard value, a relative value. And that simply means percentages. Percent. So I'm going to say width of 75%. So the percent symbol. No space again between the value and the unit. Now the point of that is, check it on Firefox, and then stretch your window. The background color stretches to always fill 75% of the width of the of the web browser. And notice that does not happen on the 300 pixel one. It's always 300. So I can set uh, I can set another style property. I've set width, and there's a bunch of them we can set. There was a question earlier about what are all the HTML tags we can use. I'll show you a website that lists them. What are all the colors I can choose from? Remember we looked at blue, yellow, azure, Alice blue. There's a bunch of others. I'll show you that list. What about all of these CSS properties that we can use? I'll show you a list of that as well. Um, Right now, we're, we're kind of seeing a few things, the tip of the iceberg. We're seeing that we can uh, edit the width and height of things. Um, why don't you try to add a width and a height to the picture? Try that. The picture right now, I don't know what size it is, but why don't you try, practice this, change the size of your picture to 512 pixels squared. Try that for a moment, and then I'll do it. See if you can figure out, how do you change the size of that picture? Try for a moment. You can do it by what we've already done before. See what happens.
try 500 pixels. All right, so uh, let me show you how I would do it. We've defined a width for the background color of H1. We can do the exact same thing with the picture. So I'm going to go to line 18 where I've got my image and after the source. It doesn't quite matter where you add style, but usually I add it after the, the source because sometimes it matters where what happens first and then what happens next. So first I want to show the picture and then I want to style it. So I'm going to add style after the source. So after my source here, after the URL, I'm going to add style, like before, quote, end quote, with colon 500px, semicolon. If we've got width, then we can have height, 500px. Well, basically the HTML goes from top to bottom, line by line, when the web browser converts it. So what we've got is that we've got the picture being shown first, and then on the next line we've got the style. So we've got the picture and then the style. Uh, so we don't know what to style until we have a picture. Question. Yeah, I think that's a relative question. I kind of didn't hear your question, but mm -hmm. was the standard coding practice like many of these things after or before? Think about it in terms of what, what is affecting what. This um, style is affecting the picture, so we don't have a picture to style if we add style first. So if we read it from left to right, we see first we get the source of the picture, and then we style the picture. So just put it in the order that makes sense for what is affecting what. Yes. So instead of the height, I gave the length. Say that again. Instead of the height, uh -huh. I gave the length and the height. Um, it seems to be working and uh, the picture looks better. Let me try something here. I'm going to remove height. I'm going to remove. I'm going to remove height. And then only length. Didn't work. Now, let me put width back in. L uh, hi height, I mean. Because you're thinking of length as a substitute to width, right? Okay, so then we'll do height. And that worked. Because it's not recognizing length, but it is recognizing height. And actually, with a picture, we really only have to define either width or height, and the other one will change in proportion. So length is not a property. I don't think it's a property. See, if I only do length, nothing happens. If I only do width, it does grow, because I only need one property, width or height. But length is not a valid property in CSS. So we'll do logic to get the well, think about it in terms of what will affect what. This style, what are we trying to affect? A picture. So we will sh we need to show the picture first. With the text, we were affecting the text and we the text that we That's true. But what we're saying here is, think about it just in terms about what's in the tag. Here we're saying, um, Yes, text follows h1, but nothing else is in the properties here. 
and then it affects all the text. I'm not sure if there's exactly a standard, but best practices usually is to think about that way, about what affects what, especially, especially with CSS, as we're seeing here, because we defined, uh, we defined this color which supersedes that color, so it's in that order, and in this case here, well, we've got a picture which is then the default behavior of it is whatever, 100 pixels. So we've superseded that default by then saying, no, make the width 500. Okay, so we've got a big old picture. It doesn't look very good because it was not designed as a big picture. We can, when we want, to change the sizes of, of text and uh, pictures. But especially with pictures, it's better to do it in a graphics program. It's better for me to have designed my picture in Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever as a nice big picture. Because when you stretch a small picture into a large picture, it loses quality. The opposite is if you start with a big picture and shrink it via CSS to a smaller size, that'll look fine, actually. So the good rule of thumb is start with the largest picture that you can and then shrink it down. It's not a good idea to blow it up. Question. Can you also use those for the picture in percentages, too? You can. Yeah, we can also put here, uh, or where is it at? Here, instead of hard values, 500 is 500, but 75% on width, and notice I'll only put a one value, and now it grows on the, based on the size of my screen. So you can put percentages also on pictures, and then that'll grow and shrink to the size of the container it's in. Yes. It does. That is a caveat, though. So if you do have a 1,000 size picture and you only need to see it as 50, you need to download the 1,000 pixel sized picture. Um, so there is a trade off there. How big of a quality, depending on, uh, on how small you need it to, to, to be visible. And the reason why I say you might want to use larger pictures is because when we deal with a device, that is three and a half inches compared to one that is four inches compared to one that is five inches, seven inches. And if you've started with a larger size, that'll good, look good in the tablet and good on the small device. You've got the size of the picture to work with, so it won't look fuzzy. Can you can, yeah. You can also target different size devices with different CSS style sheet files. Okay, so what we've been doing so far is um, CSS, and just like HTML has evolved from the 1.0 version in 1989, we've currently got HTML5, CSS is also evolving. Um, the current version is CSS3, but what we've done, we've only really tapped into CSS2. Let's do a little trick with CSS3, which was never available before until CSS3 standard. Um, this picture is a square, and if I instead wanted rounded corners, traditionally what I would do is open it in Photoshop or some graphics software, cut out those rounded corners, save it as a, as a graphic image with transparency, like a GIF or a ping, and then I've got rounded corners. Cool. Then the boss comes in and says, more roundness on those corners, please. So you go back to Photoshop, give it 12 roundness instead of 10, bring it back into the software, and then she says, I meant 15 roundness. You go back to Photoshop, do it again. That's the old days. We're living in the new days, CSS3. We can write one line of code that will give me roundness to my picture without having to take it to Photoshop. And if the boss says, make that 25 roundness, change that one line. That's CSS3. There's nothing really special to it except to write the right property. 
we just write the property and then it works with a caveat. But let's write the property. We've got the width of our picture. Uh, I'm going to put it back to just so that it's visible. I'm going to put it back on uh, 500 px. Uh, I'll do 200 px. The next property that I want here is border dash radius colon. And then I say, how much roundedness do I want? Let me start with 10 px. This is one that I don't use percent, actually. Border, radius, space, 10 px. No space between the units. Here's before, here's after. Do you see a little roundness? 10 pixels worth of roundness on all four corners. All right, let me try 25%, uh, 25 pixels. With a higher value, it should then give me more roundness. <coughs> I think we crashed my site. Nope, still there. Unless I mistyped something. Anyone see my, my misspelling? Border dash radius 10px semicolon. Raise your hand if it works. 25px. Okay, mine works too. Yeah, you can see a little roundness there for some reason. But uh, yeah, imagine the picture is working. This works. For some reason, my connection's not working. Maybe my cable got unplugged or something. But uh, that's the danger of having your picture online, right? If the picture online goes away, then it goes away in your app. Of course, we'll talk about it later to have your picture in your app. Um, but anyway, border-radius, and then a value. And so we put a roundness value around the picture. We don't have to take it to Photoshop and save it and resave it and bring it in again. We just change this value. And now CSS3 is a way that we do this. But here's the caveat. If someone visits this website on an older browser, that code there makes no sense to that browser, and therefore there's no roundness. Hopefully, though, that's not a big loss. Something like this is like icing on the cake. I want the cake. The icing is good, but I want the cake. So the cake is the picture itself and its size. The icing on the cake is something stylistic <coughs> like that, like roundness. It would be nice that my picture looks rounded. But if someone's visiting with an ancient web browser like Internet Explorer 7 or Firefox 2 or Chrome 10 or something, an old browser, they can still see the content, the picture. They can't see the roundness. That's okay. They might have a slightly diminished experience, but they didn't lose anything important. So this code right here is the official bit of CSS3 code that gives you roundness. And if you've played with any of CSS3 before, you might know about vendor prefixes and all of that. I'm not going to worry about it, because ultimately the point of that is that all web browsers will follow the standard. So I'm going to follow the standard. If a web browser doesn't follow the standard, that's okay. It's icing on the cake, like a drop shadow. We'll talk about adding a drop shadow with CSS. If the browser can't display it, it's okay, it's icing on the cake. If you really need a drop shadow, there's other things that we can do with more effort. But at the moment, at least, um, we've delved into CSS a bit. 
and a little bit of CSS, a little bit of CSS3. Hmm, did I remove something here? Oh, there it is. Thank you. So, border radius. And at a certain point, you can actually circle the square. That's how you can do that cool effect that you see on more apps or social media where your picture is a little circle instead of a boring old square. Well, you give it enough of a border radius to round it. Is it possible to turn the image into a uh, link? It is. I put here 200, and it seems to still show the same thing. It depends on the size of the picture. Now, as to make the picture a link, try to see what happens if you wrap the A tag around the picture. That's how the link worked before. So there's still more that we could do. Today was our introduction to CS to HTML5 and CSS, CSS3. And remember, we need to learn to crawl before we can learn to walk and run. We still got a ways to go from what we've got today into getting this. Notice how this has roundness and shadows and gradients and rollovers. When I put my mouse over this link, it changes. I've got animation. All of that is still HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And what we've done, what we've dealt with today is a long way from that, but we need a foundation before we get to that point. So I'm going to wrap up the lecture at this point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my work on the network folder, and I'll show you where that's at. So if you want a copy of my code, you're welcome to it. What we've done today is not mission critical. If you didn't have a chance to save it to a USB, you can get my code next time. But I'm going to save my work. Let me just set this up. If you want a copy of, of my work, you can go to the desktop. You can only do this on these computers. You can't do this at home. You want to go to the desktop and open computer. If you're on your own laptop, I don't think you can do it. You need to get on our computers. So you go to computer. You then go down here. You'll see network location. Classroom drive. Classroom data drive Z. Right there. Uh, open drive Z. And in there, you'll see the work of other instructors. Scroll down, it's alphabetical, and you'll get to Campus. Scroll down, Campus Android 1. Every day, at the end of the day, I'm going to put my work in there. You can, you're welcome to get a copy of it. What I've put there so far is to what I've done today. So if yours didn't quite look the same, you want to review the code, you're free to get it there. Copy it to your flash drive, email it to yourself. And then every day I'll do that. Any uh, general questions on everything we've talked about today? Yes. Are they only on your desktop? Uh, it looks like uh, pictures. It's like a it has like. I didn't make them, and uh, I guess it's okay to ignore them. So I don't know if you want to be safe, you can take them, copy them, but um, I don't. I don't see any on my desktop. Yes. Where at specifically? I think she. 
Oh, okay, okay. Um, you can go to the computer, the, the Z drive, the network location, and there's a bunch of names here already, alphabetical, so scroll down and you'll see Campus Android 1. So... Yes. So at this point, uh, we're wrapping it up. We'll one more thing, please, before we wrap it up. So everyone, attention, please. Uh, remember, when we come back next time, we want to line up again. It's first come, first serve. You don't have to register again. But line up. I'm going to let you guys in first. Don't tell the people that are new. Line up over there. Don't tell them that. Yeah, I can tell them that. Everyone lines up as long. Uh, if someone... Uh, was already registered today, you have first choice, but if you're one minute late, I have to give away your seat. So get here on time. We don't have to get here an hour or ten minutes early is good enough. You guys tell me? <laughs> if I mean, if we're in here tonight, we're guaranteed to get in here. Well, how could someone... That's what I'm saying. If there's already a line, and... But if there's more people in line than fit in this room, some of those people in line must not be here tonight. I will separate the lines, and then I'll let those of you that, have, that are already registered to come in first. And then if you come in two minutes later... No, but, but that, you're going to do that at 6 o'clock. Yeah. So if I'm here at 10 till, I'll get in. Yeah, but don't get mad at me if I don't know what How could someone be enrolled who's not here right now? Is that possible? Yeah. No. They, they do need to be here in person to get an ad code. And I'm probably overthinking it, but in my experience, yeah. you know, people have gotten here on time a little early to get their seats, and they get their seats. And what feels so the, the person wasn't here today, though, but then they still want to tell us that they can look at the taxes. They could. Thank you for making it understandable. Oh, you're welcome. What I try to do. Yeah, we'll be back. Thank you very much. You're welcome. See you next time. Good night, Ms. Campos. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. See you next time. Thank, Thank you. You're huh? welcome. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I have to I want to take all three of your courses, uh -huh. um, and that's why I'm in this course. Um, I've done lots of CSS and HTML, but not HTML5 and not um, CSS3. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, uh, I will be here this Thursday, but I have to be out of town for two weeks after that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, is there any way that I can work while I'm on the road? You know what? That reminded me. I forgot to tell everyone about the website to visit um, with all of these codes and such. Um, I'll, I'll tell everyone and I'll tell you if you want. But basically, if you want a way to not fall behind and such, what you can do is go to w3schools.com. Turn on that. Uh, on that site there, there's HTML tutorials. Now, I don't follow them exactly, but you can go there. And uh, many of the yeah. things that you might have missed, there you go. Okay. Yes, I've already done that. Um, okay. Um, and I probably will get the book. Just have it. Um, but uh, and also remember all of my code. Actually, one more thing. All of